Hey, Mushroom Nerds, it's Anna McHugh. I want to share with you a couple of things that I found today, uh, starting off with a mushroom I've talked about on this channel before, but I just love it so very much. This is Cantharellus cinnabarinus, uh, also known as the cinnabar red or simply the red chanterelle. As you can see, it's sort of a construction cone, orange little mushroom and is uh, fairly frail with a very uh, sort of thin stem. And then underneath, instead of uh, sort of gills that are, uh, you know, deep and blade-like, they are forked and interconnected in between. And that's a real dead giveaway for uh, a lot of the mushrooms in the Cantharellus genus, so chanterelles collectively. What makes Cantharellus uh, cinnabarinus kind of unusual is, again, its diminutive size. And also when you open it up, uh, you'll see that the mushroom itself is really quite, uh, you know, thin and dainty on the inside. And it's sort of a pale color, but it's a little orangey. I mention that because other chanterelles, when you open them up, they're kind of large and chunky and they have uh, white flesh on the inside. But you'll find these mushrooms, uh, you know, growing in patches of uh, moss in particular. It's really beautiful. They are edible. They do need to be cooked. And I want to talk about, uh, you know, edibility and cooking mushrooms in just a moment and why you should do that and all the things. Uh, but, you know, you have to collect a good number of them and they do cook down and lose a little bit of their mass. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, it's a really nice species to find. And my main thing about them, again, is their propensity for growing in really delightful, sort of vibrantly colored mosses. Uh, and that, that contrast is really nice. And they're, you know, very flowery appearing. And so I, I just love finding this mushroom. Uh, the other thing that I want to highlight about Cantharella cinnabarinus is uh, it is one of our chanterelles that has a longer fruiting season than some of our larger sort of golden colored chanterelle mushrooms. So if you're familiar with chanterelle hunting in the eastern United States, it is sort of a like summertime affair. And here in the Raleigh area where I live, uh, the height of chanterelle season is typically like mid-July or so. But uh, Cantharellus cinnabarinus uh, really just seems to fruit for a longer period of time. And, you know, they're very small mushrooms, as you can see. They never get really large, like the one I was just throwing around is about the, you know, a little bit larger than the size of my thumb. And that's about the largest that you ever see them. And, uh, you know, nonetheless, you'll see uh, the kind of like a few times throughout the year. So this area I spend a lot of time in. And, and one of my favorite things about it is that I get to... Uh, you know, look at mushrooms year after year and kind of see what that organism is doing. And so, for instance, this particular critter, uh, I have seen this is the uh, second fruiting this year that I have observed. And so, you know, it's really clear that at least, I mean, it may not be the exact same individual mycelium, but that particular area is like three or four feet. Uh, you get a couple of different flushes throughout the year. So, um, you know, that's a mushroom to look out for. It won't persist long into the fall. Like chanterelles really start to taper off and like fall is, is uh, an event of its own and a whole lot of new and interesting species uh, start to come out that uh, just don't fancy the hot weather. Uh, but nonetheless, chanterelle season is also something we kind of have to say goodbye to as soon as the weather starts to turn. So uh, I wanted to talk to you about um, cooking mushrooms and why you should do that. Before I do, I'm going to share with you a beautiful little specimen of a Romaria mushroom. So, excuse me, uh, the sort of really broad common name for this would be a coral mushroom. And Romaria is a genus that contains a lot of species. I'm no good at them. And so I'm usually just like, ah, it's Romaria. And the way that you can tell this uh, is a Romaria is, well, first of all, it looks like a coral. But there are other genera of mushrooms that look like coral. So we have uh, the edible Artemisis uh, pixidatus. We have Clavularia and Clavulina and Lantaria and like all kinds of genera of other sort of coral looking mushrooms. But as luck would have it, Romaria is the one that grows from the ground and is very, very fleshy uh, by way of comparison. So a lot of those other things I was just mentioning uh, they are more slender. Also, when you pay, take them apart, they tend to be more fibrous and dry. Like even the edible Artemisia pixidatus, which is one of my favored ed edible mushrooms that I've made, a, I think, a couple of videos about. Even that one is not fleshy by way of uh, comparison with Romaria. 
And I don't eat Romeria mushrooms myself, but a lot of people do. And uh, most of them are considered to be safe and some of them are uh, have a, uh, you know, described laxative effect is how it's described in the guidebooks. They're so very proper and polite uh, in, in the world of, um, you know, field book, book guide publishing. But, uh, you know, regardless of that, it is very important uh, to cook you know, Romeria mushrooms to cook your chanterelle mushrooms. Basically, uh, there are only a few mushrooms that I know by name that I will eat uncooked. And there are a couple of reasons for this. So I break those reasons into three categories. First is safety. Second is nutrition. And third is enjoyment. <laughs> so uh, firstly, let's go for safety. Anytime, you know, you're like me and you're rooting around on the forest floor, you're picking up these uh, fruiting bodies that also uh, can necrotize very quickly and they can, you know, start to get a lot of, you know, bacterial and fungal activity and insects, all kinds of stuff. And as you can see, you know, one of the things that's so remarkable about Romeria is all of these beautiful little, uh, you know, fingers and fronds and so forth. But all of that, plus the fact that mushrooms are, you know, chock full of, uh, of proteins and so forth, just makes them really um, edible to pretty much everything. So you want to cook uh, your wild foods because that helps uh, make sure that they're safe and kills anything that's on the surface of them. Additionally, there are numerous species of mushrooms that will make you sick if you do not cook them. So, for instance, morel mushrooms, the Morchella genus, everybody goes crazy for them. As far as wild mushrooms are concerned, probably one of the most popular ones in the world. If you eat it raw, it will make you very, very, very sick. And uh, so, you know, it is important to note that uh, in the same way that, like, you don't eat chicken raw, there are certain mushrooms that you don't eat raw. And in general, when I'm collecting wild food, I cook it anyway, again, for that reason that I mentioned before. So that's the safety thing. The second thing is nutrition. So in order to get the nutritional benefit of uh, eating mushrooms, and as I mentioned, a lot of them have a lot of protein in them, um, they need to be cooked and heat treated. And the reason for that is that mushrooms have uh, cell walls that are made of chitin. So it's just a really robust uh, organic molecule. It makes uh, crab shells br brittle, for instance, and hard. Uh, so it's sort of a hardening agent. Anyway, it needs to be cooked in order for you to get the um, um, nutritional benefit of any of the goodies that are in mushrooms. And that's inclusive of mushrooms that you want to use medicinally. So for instance, this is Trimedes versicolor, the turkey tail mushroom, very common. And I wanted to show you also, this is a perfect specimen if you are interested in collecting it medicinally. So what you have is a mushroom that's not fleshy in the way that I was showing you with the Romeria or um, you know with that chanterelle, but it's more of a uh, leathery, kind of consistency and it's a little bit on the furry side and you can see it also has beautiful sort of uh, variegated patterning. In this case it's brown, sometimes it's green, sometimes it's brown and green, sometimes when it's really cold out it's almost blue. So this can be quite varied in color but you have this banded um, turkey tail looking appearance on the top of the fruiting bodies. And then if you're collecting them for, um, you know, for uh, medicinal purposes, you want to look for mushrooms that are nice and white and fresh underneath. And so this is what is called um, a polypore. So it has a polyporous undersurface. It's just, and it's very hard to see just given how small they are, but they're just little pores. It's kind of a, a roughened surface. So that's where all of your spores come from. But in the case of Trimedes versicolor, uh, you know, it has been used medicinally for thousands of years in Chinese medicine, and there's a lot of really promising research in the area of uh, medicinal mushrooms, specifically Trimedes versicolor. But in order to, you know, prepare it in a tea or other uh, sort of preparations, um, you know, heat treatment is a really fundamental way to do that. So, you know, if you're really interested in exploring medicinal mushrooms, I am not an expert and I encourage you to sort of go in that direction. But if your objective is like, I want to get to the, like, the ability to collect the ingredients for a medicinal tea based on the principles of Chinese herbal medicine and make it in my home, you're going to want to, uh, you know, take these fruiting bodies and simmer them for 15 minutes or so in water. And again, that uh, helps with extraction. And uh, so, you know, you need to do that, whether you're going to eat it, whether you're going to drink it medicinally, what have you, and so forth. All right, so um, those were the top two reasons, are your, your safety and uh, your nutritional value. But thirdly, 
And most importantly to me, well, no, not most importantly, I want to be safe and I want to get nutritional benefit from the food that I eat, but it's also an enjoyment thing. So before I got into wild mushroom hunting, as many people have, I went to my fair share of, you know, salad bars and saw these giant chunks of like really uh, neglected, dilapidated looking uh, Agaricus bisporus or white button mushrooms raw and I'd just throw them on the salad and I'd crunch through them and they were chalky and they had a little bit of flavor but it was just sort of like eh mushrooms okay it's just sort of this like adjunct thing to an already mediocre thing that is a salad bar salad and uh once I started to get interested in wild mushrooms and people are like why would you not I, re I remember I had this wonderful conversation with a friend of mine who is also quite um health conscious and so you know his openness to things like people who are into raw food or people who um you know have just various uh like chosen dietary restrictions he's very tolerant of and tried to be inclusive of those people and so uh you know i had fielded a question at one point from someone who's a raw foodist about whether or not to chemical cook mushrooms and the best way to do that and the best acids to achieve that and my friend was like I mean, I get it. And the best way, he describes some of the best ways, which I don't remember because I'm like, I'm never going to do this. Um, but he said, you know, one of the things that you're going to end up with is something obviously that's highly acidic. And one of the great pleasures of eating mushrooms are that the, they're these wonderful sort of savory, almost meat-like, but definitely like, I don't say mushrooms are like meat. I do often for the sake of... Um, drawing parallels but they are not the same thing and so like eating a really good edible mushroom that is prepared with you know uh, obviously butter and sea salt but you know in my case it's usually a lighter oil and sea salt but at the same time the ability to um you know cook and heat prepare a lot of these mushrooms brings out their flavor and to that point the white button mushroom is much maligned, in my opinion. I buy baby bellas and I enjoy, you know, cooking them thoroughly and they have that really nice mushroominess that uh, really can only be achieved, you know, through cooking them. And I, I mean, maybe not only, I'm sure there are probably other ways. And to, to my point about being tolerant of other ways of approaching these things culinarily, the variety of flavors, textures, and experiences you can get with uh, wild mushrooms never ceases to amaze me. So, you know, it's everything from candy cap, mushroom ice cream, which is like, at this point, seems like a fairly straightforward idea to me, to chanterelle chutneys, all kinds of different, like really uh, fascinating ways of, of preparing these uh, different mushrooms. Because a lot of them also have really distinctive flavors of their own that when you uh, prepare them in certain ways makes them, you know, a winner or a loser. And when it comes to me, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, cook it very thoroughly, clean it very thoroughly, and usually my methods are like butter and sea salt and a couple of the herbs that I like, so it's very basic. All right, so I've talked about why you cook your mushrooms and why you, uh, you know, heat treat any of your medicinals, including your beautiful Trimedes Versicolor. Um, and I wanted to conclude with uh, a little plant, actually. This is uh, a parasitic plant. The common name is beech drop. And it's uh, Epiphagus virginiana is the scientific name for it. And Epiphagus is in reference to it being a parasite that attaches to beech trees. And this is a, one of those interesting little plants that is non-photosynthetic. So as you can see, it doesn't have any green on it. And that is not just like the conditions that this particular specimen is in. This little critter does not make its own food for itself. It is... Uh, much more inclined, well, is uh, obligated, it is an obligate parasite of the beech tree, which is uh, the, it's a uh, Phagus grandiifola. So Epiphagus, the genus name for this particular uh, thingy, is basically, it means attached to beech. And so it's this stringy kind of, um, you know, almost more like a weed in a way, but it has this really beautiful sort of light, uh, purplish pinkish coloration oftentimes and uh, you will see it also as the um, season progresses it produces these little sterile uh, 
flowers that are kind of like, they, they look a little bit like straws. I don't know. I am very bad with all of the way, like I have so many mushroom synonyms in my mind. Like I can look at a mushroom and say, oh, that looks like a cinnamon roll on day three. It is a Pillsbury and uh, you cooked it at 425. And that is what that is. And like, I just have a lot of ways to like map mushrooms to my experiences. You get me in plant territory. I'm like, it's like a weed, or maybe it has buds that look a little bit like, oh, I don't know, like buds or something. So forgive me for that. But the flowers are really nice. And it's interesting too, that they are sterile flowers as opposed to, uh, you know, pollinating ones. But anyway, the thing that I also like about Beach Drop that I think is really cool and why I decided I was going to talk about it is uh, as it is a parasite what it does is it develops this little knotty tuber that's called a haustorium uh, that basically attaches itself to the root system of the host beech tree and oftentimes when you see this little plant like this one I just reached down to to you know boop it and it just fell over and this popped out of the ground so they're very uh, you know oftentimes very delicate and very loosely moored but this uh, haustorium thing is just really neat and it's, it's kind of a way that um, different plants and organisms sort of build the structures that uh, allow them to attach to hosts or symbiotes. Um, anyway, again, like I am starting to uh, drift in the direction of learning more about plants, but as it has taken me many, many years to even get my basics on uh, mushroom biology, I would imagine plants will take me just as long, if not longer, uh, given the fact that a lot of the foundational knowledge that I would need of like, for instance, basic synonyms or basic terminology are uh, at this point lacking. But anyway, I really uh, hope that you're enjoying the beginning of the fall and I hope it comes to you soon if it hasn't arrived yet. I hope we get the rains that we need so I can share lots of cool mushrooms with you. But in the meantime, stay well and get out in the woods as often as you can. It is just the best thing you can do with your time.